You're listening to Strange News on Strange But True Radio, episode 8 of 2023, with me, Philip Keeler, in the UK. We are powered by the Spreaker Network and a fabulous job they do too. Download us by searching Strange But True Radio on any podcast provider, including YouTube and Amazon Prime Podcast. Well, hello everyone. Um, what have you been up to? Anything good? Interesting? Been out and about? Well, a few days ago, some children thought it would be fun to throw a large stone from a bridge at my car. It chipped the windscreen. I braked quite heavily. Thankfully, no one was behind me. No one was in front anyway, as well. Um, We were very, very lucky that it was a quiet journey that afternoon. Tom the dog and I were very shaken up by this, obviously. Um, You know, it, it, it could have been a very different situation altogether. On a busy day, maybe a pile up, it could have killed us and others. So I guess the moral to what I'm telling you is if you have kids or know anyone who thinks it is a fun idea to throw stones off bridges onto cars, have a very strong word for us. It's just, I don't understand the mentality of people that, that do that. Anyway. This is your weekly dose of the paranormal. Things that are out of the ordinary, weird signs and strange discoveries from around the world. And on this edition, ancient aliens, UFOs and UAPs have long history going back to before Christ was born. An update on NASA's search for planets with life. More Loch Ness monster sightings in Scotland. Do you want to live forever? One man in the US thinks he has found the answer. The show is best listened to the in the evening time, so turn the lights down low as we go into the night. Well, we start with this, theconversation.com reporting. For thousands of years, people have been describing unexplainable gleaming objects in the sky. Some aerial phenomena, like comets, meteor showers, auroras, or even earthquake, lightning, all easily explained by today's knowledge, were widely reported in the ancient world. The US Congress is currently investigating UAPs, what you might think of as UFOs. In the wake of previously classified footage of UAPs being leaked and a former intelligence official alleging the US government possesses off-world technologies, meanwhile a recent NASA report concluded there is no evidence to suggest UAPs are of extraterrestrial origin. Ancient writers saw these phenomena as signs of social unease, an impending disaster. In this way, modern reactions to UAPs are similar to those of thousands of years ago. There is a long history of strange objects in the sky associated with political and military crisis. In the Bible, the prophet Ezekiel uh, mentioned a divine chariot It glowed like hot metal in a fire and could see four living beings in it. They looked human-like, though they had four faces and four wings. The Vimana, the flying chariots of the gods, also appear in ancient Indian epics, including uh, many Hindu myths. The gods were portrayed as riding these chariots to every corner of the universe. 
Describing portents of the winter of 28, uh, sorry, 218 BC, uh, the Roman historian Livy said a spectacular a spectacle of ships gleamed in the sky so this was in 2018 bc uh, the second punic war had begun and the enemy general hannibal was on the verge of a series of victories maybe these ships in the sky were odd cloud formations but levy's choice of words suggests something shining or gleaming qualities even today associated with UAPs. Levi uh, reports another appearance of ships in the sky in uh, 173 BC when a great fleet allegedly appeared in the spring of 217 BC. With Hannibal still threatening Rome, Levi says round shields were seen in the sky over central Italy. Levi doesn't say if these objects gleamed like the ships seen previous years, but the shields recall the appearance of flying saucers, the type of UAP that came to prominence in the height of the Cold War. Another curious classical UAP is recorded by the Greek writer Plutarch in his life of uh, Lucullus, I think it's pronounced, I'm not too sure. Uh, a Roman general, Lucullus, uh, forces were about to fight King uh, Mithridates, uh, Mithridates, I think, of Pontus, where when a strange object, strange object appeared between the two armies. Um, that object was described as a pithos, a vessel, which has specific shape, suggests something uh, more than a flashing light. Some have interpreted this as a meteor. But uh, Plutarch's focus on its shiny metallic nature does not match this possibility. Um, Whatever it was, both armies thought it was a bad omen and withdrew from each other. Roman Jewish historian Josephus writing about a war between Roman and Jewish forces, records an aerial battle between UAPs in AD 65. Before sunset, chariots were seen in the sky, accompanied by armed battalions hurtling through the clouds. Josephus says numerous eyewitnesses saw it and believed it foretold the Roman victory that followed. For more on that article, because it's it's quite a long article, I'm not going to read all of it, uh, go to theconversation.com. And, you know, it is fascinating because I, I, I do watch a, a series called Ancient Aliens and the Egyptians and their cave paintings. In, 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 they all describe these sorts of things as well. So it's it has a long, long history from sort of, beginning of time i'm gonna to have to look into this a little bit more because i'm fascinated um i mean i'm not really a religious person so i don't know whether i'm gonna pick up a bible but i'm gonna try and find out more about uaps and ufos long time in in history you know they they were talking about ad 65 218 bc 217 bc 173 bc that's a heck of a long time ago, obviously. And to have these curious ships in the sky at that time must have been a, also quite frightening, don't you think? Some of them, I have heard of, of um, like writings in, time, in history saying that these were angels. Um, and... I suppose in that era, somebody floating down in a beam of light from a UFO, yeah, they they would probably describe that as an angel, wouldn't they? Uh, send us your thoughts. I'd be interested to hear what you think about ancient aliens, ancient UFO a- UAPs. The technology seems to have changed, though, don't you think? So there were more sort of flying saucer type objects then and maybe in the 19 bring it back to sort of almost current day 1940s 
saucer shape. But now we're talking about things in the shape of a tic-tac. They call it a tic-tac, don't they? So the, the type of craft being used is changing over time quite slowly, isn't it? But um, yeah, that's another thing to sort of think about. I was quite disappointed uh, with NASA when they said they didn't find sort of any evidence of extraterrestrial aircraft, UAPs and UFOs. I don't, I don't really believe that. But I am kind of hopeful that this next story will pose an interesting one for NASA. Uh, LifeScience.com reporting NASA's James Webb Space Telescope, also known as JWST, has revealed homemade carbon dioxide on Jupiter's icy moon Europa, raising the possibility that the frigid water world could host life. I've heard this about Europa before, actually, many years ago. Uh, Europa, which is a little bit smaller than Earth's moon, is covered with a crust of water ice enveloping a saltwater ocean. Wow. Uh, The presence of liquid water makes Europa, Europa an intriguing object of exploration for scientists interested in extraterrestrial life. But until now, no one had shown that the ocean contained the proper molecules particularly carbon, which is a fundamental building block of life on Earth. The new detection by JWST is intriguing because the carbon dioxide does not seem to have been carried by a meteorite or asteroid and appears in a geologically young region of the Moon called Tara Regio, um, suggesting the gas may have formed within the Moon itself. Previous observations from the Hubble Space Telescope show evidence for ocean-derived salt in Terra Regio. Uh, Cornell University planetary uh, scientist Samantha Trumbo said in a statement, Now we're seeing that carbon dioxide is heavily concentrated there as well. We think this implies that the carbon probably has its ultimate origin in the internal ocean. Trumbo is the lead author of one of two papers on the new Europa observation published in the journal Science on September 21st. Uh, Thanks to JWST's power, researchers needed only minutes of the observatory's time to discern new details about Europa. Heidi Hamill of the Association of Universities for Research in Astronomy said in the statement, uh, the researchers found signs of both crystalline and amorphous carbon dioxide on Europa. Um, Amorphous refers to a disorganised molecular form as compared with the rigid patterns of crystals. They saw high concentration in what astronomers call chaos regions, where the surface crust has been disrupted and there is likely movement of materials between the crust an interior ocean. Because carbon dioxide doesn't stay stable for long on uh, Europa's surface, the researchers believe that the carbon came up from the ocean relatively recently. Europa's surface is on average around 60 million years old, as estimated by the few craters uh, pockmarking the ice according to 2022 research. The chaos terrain is generally younger than average. Scientists are planning two missions to Europa in the upcoming years. NASA's Clipper mission, expected to launch in 2024, will provide observations of the Moon from orbit with a focus on searching for molecules and conditions conductive to life. Meanwhile, the European Space Agency launched the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, also known as JUICE. That's a nice name, isn't it? JUICE spacecraft in April. 
it will arrive at the gas giant in 2031. Wow, that is a long time. I didn't realize that that was so far away from us. Um, I suppose it is. That craft will conduct 35 flybys of the three moons, Europa, Ganymede and uh, Callisto, I think it's pronounced. Um, That sounds fascinating. I I wonder if they're going to land, though. They need to, don't they need to land something? Just take another look. That sounds amazing. Uh, You know what? I've always wondered, right, how, how they communicate with this aircraft these sorts of aircraft when they're flying such distances you know that is one of them setting up the nasa project is setting off in 2024 and won't actually get to where it needs to be until 2031 how do they do that how do they how do they communicate like like that in deep space amazing they must be using some fantastic technology don't you think Good luck to them. You know, I I thought they were going to find more stuff on Mars. I'm still very hopeful. Um, and in fact, didn't they see? Didn't they? Didn't they get some sort of worm or from Mars? From what I heard, this was a long time ago. They might have done. I'm not totally sure. That might not be accurate. I might have been on a weird website. Anyway. Um, I think more research into Mars needs to be done. Uh, particularly getting, I like the idea of them uh, getting a base on Mars and people living there. I'm very interested in that. Anyway, after the break, I'll be telling you about sightings of the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland. Obviously in Scotland. There are other sort of monsters in different lakes around the world aren't there but uh the big the big uh, the big one is the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland plus I'll, I'll be asking you um do you want to live forever do you want to live forever if I had the opportunity I guess I would well one man in the USA thinks he has found the answer but he's been very restrictive in his life all of that coming up after the break We are the Strange But True Radio podcast, independent news talk, with thousands of listeners each month by people who love news, politics and dislike the Tories. We also talk about the strange stuff like UFOs and the paranormal. We're on all the podcast platforms, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio and many more. If you want to advertise your business and get out to a worldwide audience, choose us. Email studio at strangebuttrueradio.com and start your growth in worldwide sales today.
Right then, we're back. If you want to uh, get some merchandise on our show, um, we've got new merchandise. Well, it's not. It's, it is new. It's the first time we've ever done this, um, and you can get beanies. Just loading up the link to tell you what we've got. Uh, we, you, we've got beanies, we've got t shirts, we've got hoodies, we've got uh, tote bags, good for shopping, so you don't use plastic. Uh, we've got mugs with our logo. We've sort of got two logos um, one, a squ- one a square one and one round logo, but they look really good. The mugs look fantastic. Uh, you can either have a black mug. A black mug or a more spacey one, which I think I'll probably buy uh, later today. And uh, you can also, what, what's that? A tumbler. You can get a tumbler. That's, so that's a, a sort of mug without handles. Um, but I, I do like that. I think the best product right now uh, are the mugs. And they're only $14.50. All right. Um, there's a bit of um, postage to pay on top, but uh, for a mug, that's pretty good. That works out to be around £12.50 in the UK, roughly speaking, which isn't bad, is it? So get your mugs, get your T-shirts, hoodies. Lovely. I'd, uh, I'd, I'd like you to do that. And wear it round your local area. Wear it round on holiday as well. Let people know that we are a podcast and we're broadcasting and um well this show's a load of nonsense sometimes isn't it but uh phil's show on a monday is more newsy more hardcore political stuff but um <laughs> i like the paranormal stuff i've always loved it and that's why i do this part of the show Love that music. Uh, so that can only mean one thing. We are going to Scotland and uh, singular40in.com reporting this. Uh, four reports published in August by the official Loch Ness Monster Sightings Register uh, bring the total number of reported Nessie, as the monster is affectionately known, sightings up to seven so far in 2023. Uh, The first sightings came at around 1pm on August the 17th from Steve Valentine, who was visiting Scotland's Loch Ness while on holiday from Ernston in Manchester uh, with his family. Uh, They were returning from a tour of the loch when Valentine, great name, love that name, uh, said he uh, spotted something uh, from the deep scan boat they were on board. I just saw a black shape in the water, he said. It was when we were returning to the dock near to Urquhart Castle. I, I lost sight of it when the boat turned, but managed to get a quick photo from a distance. The next two sightings took place on consecutive days during the investigation of Loch Ness by independent volunteer research organisation Loch Ness Exploration the largest investigation of its kind since 1972. Do you remember us talking about this a few weeks ago? So that was that. Um, At 3.20 on August the 26th, Alistair Gray said that he saw something unusual about halfway across the lock from his position near uh, Ivor Morriston uh, while participating in the investigation. Gray who's a civil servant. So he, he he should be quite a good witness, shouldn't he? Because he's a civil servant, although um, most civil servants don't do very much. Uh, reportedly, I'm not saying he doesn't do very much. He's probably a good one. Reportedly, uh, so Gray, a civil servant, reportedly saw three odd and seemingly connected shapes in the water. Uh, one part of the shape was sticking out of the water at a 45 degree angle as two humps appeared to be rising and falling as though the object was moving. 
Uh, Janoway's sighting is similar to that of French tourist Etienne Camel, a pharmacist from Lyon, who, along with his wife Elaine, claimed to have seen uh, a 65-foot-long dark object moving below the surface of Loch Ness while visiting the area on June 15th of this year. Finally, at 10.45am on August 31st, visitor Fiona Wade reported a shape similar to that reported by Alistair Gray just a few days before. It was almost identical to that seen on Saturday and probably in a very similar location, she said. I might add that I was not aware of this sighting on Saturday until returning home this evening. It initially looked like a periscope, but then two curved areas followed. It was moving and about halfway out in the lock, looking roughly over a midway between Foyers and Whitebridge. I have seen deer crossing before, but this was like nothing I've ever seen before. And I can only describe it as Nessie, as I can't think of any logical thing it could have been. It was large enough to catch my eye and it appeared to leave a slight wake behind it. The water was reportedly flat and calm and no nearby boat activity during Wade's sighting, which lasted about 30 to 40 seconds. One popular sceptical explanation for sightings of strange wakes are rogue waves. Well, rogue waves are waves caused by wind, currents and other circumstances that are far larger than the average waves of a given time and place. Many skeptics uh, skeptics even believe that rogue waves can be mistaken for the wake of a large animal. And mundane objects like driftwood or animals such as otters are often used by skeptics to explain sightings of a physical monster. However, some believe that sightings of strange moving objects in Loch Ness, like those reported by Gray or Wade, are indictive of indicative rather sorry of a surviving uh, population of plesiosaurs um i've heard of this before the plesiosaur um although others argue that more recent scientific study makes that possibility unlikely plesiosaurs aquatic reptiles in other words who first appeared in the fossil records around 200 million years ago and were thought to have died off 66 million years ago the same time as the dinosaurs are a popular explanation for the monster said to inhabit Scotland's Loch Ness an explanation first introduced in the 1930s and later popularised by naturist Sir Peter Scott and zoologist Dennis Tucker well, obviously, you know, if if they are t- talking about um, a plesiosaurs, it's not going to be the same like plesiosaur from 200 million years ago. So that would make, obviously, us all think that um, there's quite a number of plesiosaurs in Loch Ness. Families, generations, um... I don't know how long plesiosaurs lived. Probably nobody ever knows because it was before mankind. Um, So, I mean, it could be a plesiosaur. I mean, there's, I guess there's plenty of fish in there or whatever they eat. I don't know what they eat. But, um, yeah, it's not this... Everyone talks about Loch Ness as this sort of mystical creature. But it's if it's something like a plesiosaur, then it's it's not it's just a dinosaur that hasn't hasn't died and it's and it's shy. It's quite shy. And you know, I imagine it would be quite shy because they hear boat engines going up and down the lock. They will want to be in deep water away from people. So anyway, it is an interesting one. It's a, it is a mystery, I guess, still. Um, no, no real video or camera footage. I think most of the, 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 the camera, uh, the photographs and film footage has 
sort of been debunked, unfortunately. But um, there are some people that still believe that there is a creature in Loch Ness. And I, I kind of like that mystery. I like mysteries. Um, I would like them to solve that mystery, though, I must say. Because what that would mean for, you know, science and history, it would change, wouldn't it? It would mean that a plesiosaur is still lie alive. A family of plesiosaurs are alive in Scotland. And that would be amazing. That would be absolutely amazing. Now then, uh, Time.com reporting this one uh, by reporter Charlotte Alter about the man who thinks he can live forever. And if Charlotte's listening, this was fantastic reporting. I absolutely... um, It was a a must read. And um, you'll be able to read more as well because I'm not going to read the whole article. Um, Go to Time.com reporting by Charlotte Alter about the man who thinks he can live forever. So then, um, in a neat little neighbourhood in Venice, California, USA, there's a block of squat, similar homes, filled with mortals spending their infinite days on the planet, eating pizza with friends, blowing out candles on birthday cakes, and binging late-night television. Halfway down the street, there's a cavernous black modern box this is where brian johnson is working and what he calls the most significant revolution in the history of homo sapiens johnson who's 46 is a center millionaire tech entrepreneur who has spent most of the last three years in pursuit of singular goal don't die during that time He's spent more than $4 million developing a life extension system called Blueprint in which he outsources every decision involving his body to a team of doctors who use data to develop a strict health regime to reduce what Johnson calls his biological age. That system includes, and wait for this, 111 pills every day. That's 111 pills every day he eats, swallows. Uh, Wearing a baseball cap that shoots red light into his scalp, collecting his own stool samples and sleeping with a tiny jetpack attached to his penis. Yes, you heard it right. Uh, Attached to his penis to monitor his nighttime erections. I was a bit taken aback when I first read that. Uh, Johnson thinks of any act that accelerates aging, like eating a cookie or getting less than eight hours of sleep, as an act of violence. Johnson is not the only ultra rich middle aged man trying to vanquish the ravages of uh, time. Jeff Bezos and Peter Thiel uh, were both early investors in Unity biotechnology a company devoted to developing therapeutics to slow or reverse diseases associated with aging elite athletes employ therapies to keep their bodies young from hyperbaric and cryotherapy chambers to recovery sleepwear but johnson's quest is not just about staying rested or maintaining muscle tone it's about turning his whole body over to an anti-aging algorithm. He believes death is optional. He plans never to do it. Outsourcing the management of his body means defeating what Johnson calls his rascal mind. The part of us that wants to eat ice cream after dinner or have sex at 1am or drink beer with friends. The goal is is to get his 46-year-old organs to look and act like 18-year-old organs. 
Johnson says the data compiled by his doctors suggests that Blueprint has so far given him the bones of a 30-year-old and the heart of a 37-year-old. The experiment has proven competent system is better at managing me than a human can, Johnson says. A breakthrough that he says is reframing what it means, means to be human. He describes his intense diet and exercise regime as falling somewhere between the Italian Renaissance and the invention of calculus in the pantheon of human achievement. Michelangelo had the Sistine Chapel. Johnson has his special green juice. But when I showed up at Johnson's house on Monday in August, I wasn't really there to figure out if his elaborate age-defying strategies actually work. I assume that given my family history of cancer and personal fondness for pepperoni pizza, I probably won't live long enough to find out. Instead, I spent three days observing Johnson to learn what a life run by an algorithm would look like and whether the next evolution of being human would have any real humanity at all. If living like Johnson meant you could live forever, a big if, would it even be worth it? <clears throat> That's a good question the reporters post there. Would, would it be worth it? You, you're sacrificing so much, aren't you? You can't have the occasional ice cream. I don't even think he drinks coffee. Um, Kate Tolo opens the door to Johnson's house and welcomes me inside. Tolo a 27-year-old former fashion strategist who is originally from Australia, is Johnson's uh, chief marketing officer and uh, most loyal disciple. Two months ago, she became the first person, aside from Johnson, to commit to Blueprint, making her the first test of how Blueprint works on a female body. Tolo is known as Blueprint XX. The home is beautiful and devoid of clutter, with floor-to-ceiling windows looking out on the pool and lush greenery outside. It reminds me of an apple store in a jungle. Tolo offers me a little bowl of special chocolate, which had been undutched, stripped of heavy, metal, heavy metals and sourced only from regions with high polyphenol density. It tastes like a foot. <laughs> She also makes me a juice like concoction that contains uh, corella powder and spermidine amino complex, creatine, collagen peptides, cocoa, cocoa uh, flafunnels, flafunnels, and uh, Ceylon cinnamon. Tolo and Johnson call it the green giant, but it looks almost black like the stuff that washes off a duck after an oil spill. She manages to mix it without getting any of the duck sludge on her immaculate white jumpsuit. It moves through some people's digestive system faster than others, she chirps, gesturing to the nearby bathroom. I take a tentative sip. It tastes like Gatorade, but sandy. Johnston walks into the room wearing a green T-shirt and tiny white shorts. He has the body of an 18-year-old and the face of someone who had spent millions attempting to look like an 18-year-old. His skin is pale and glowing, which is partly because of the multiple laser treatments he's done and partly because he had no hair on his entire body. The hair on his head is not dyed, Johnson says but he does use a grey hair reversal concoction, which includes an herbal extraction that colours the hair a darkish brown. He, he gestures to my green giant and then toward the bathroom. Did you warn her? He asks Tolo. I pretend to take another sip. <clears throat> the next day, Johnson walks me through this morning routine step by step. He woke up at 4.53am, but delayed most of his routine until I arrive at 7am to observe him. His bedroom has almost nothing in it. No photos, no books, 
No television, no glass of water, no phone charger, no chair with piled up clothes. A bit like mine, actually. He tried uh, clothes he tried on once. No dry cleaning. He uh, meant to put away no towels, no mirror, no nothing. I only sleep here, he says. No work, no reading. The only two objects in the room besides his bed are a laser face shield he uses for collagen growth and wrinkle reduction and the device he wears on his penis while he sleeps to measure his nighttime erections. (laughs) I have, on average, two hours and 12 minutes each night of erections of a certain quality, he says. To be age 18, it would be three hours and 20 minutes. Nighttime erections, he says, are a biological age marker for your sexual function, one that also has implications for cardiovascular fitness. The erection tracker looks like a uh, little AirPods case with a turquoise strap, like a purse worn by a penis. <laughs> no penises were viewed were, were, were viewed in the reporting of this article. I hope she didn't touch the uh, the, the, the penis monitor. Um, when Johnson wakes up and removes the device, he weighs himself on a scale that uses electrical impedance to measure his uh, weight, body mass index, hydration level, body fat, and something called pulse wave velocity, which he explained, but I didn't quite grasp. I'm in the top 1% of ideal muscle fat, he says. Then he turns on his light therapy lamp, which mimics sun exposure for two to three minutes to reset his circadian rhythms. He takes his inner ear temperature to monitor changes in his body and starts off with two pills of ferritin to boost his iron. Along with some vitamin C, he washes his face, uses cream to prevent wrinkles and puts on a laser light mask for five minutes with red and blue lights designed to stimulate collagen growth and control blemishes. But this time, it's typically 6am. Johnson walks downstairs to start his day. The blueprint supplement regime is arranged on Johnson's kitchen counter, organised from left to right. It begins with eye drops for his pre-cataracts, then uses a little vibrating device against the side of his nose to simulate a nerve that apparently helps his eyes create tears. Johnson makes his green giant, then starts taking more pills in between sips of dark green sludge. It's what my body has asked for, he says. Does he ever miss coffee, even a little? I love coffee. It's so fun, he says. It's an addictive escalation drug for me. At this point, He begins doing special exercises to increase his grip strength. Then he heads to to his home gym, decorated with a floor-to-ceiling wallpaper, photographs of a forest, and starts an hour-long routine. Johnson can leg press 800 pounds, but his daily workout isn't much more advanced than something you'd see from a very enthusiastic guy at the gym. A series of weights, planks, and stretches. He does this seven times days a week. He adds on a high intensity workout three days a week. Occasionally during these high intensity workouts, he wear a plastic mask to measure his VO2 max or the maximum rate of oxygen consumption during physical exercise. Johnson's VO2 max is in the top 1.5 of 18 year olds, he says. Incredible. It's incredible what people do. And you can read more on that story, as I say, said at the beginning of the article from um, time.com reporting by Charlotte Alter. Um, I mean, he's he he obviously has a lot of money to be able to do that, doesn't he? He is um, a center millionaire, as the uh, the article describes. And he's 46 with a body which is more like an 18-year-old. I mean, I, I'll put it out there. If if you were a millionaire or a billionaire, we would probably, you would probably be uh, looking after your body a lot better anyway because you're not eating far, all the fast food. You can afford to buy good food, good vegetables, 
really good meat. Um, you can afford all those vitamins and minerals which cost the earth if you go to the supermarket. Some of them are like between 10 and 20 pounds for like two weeks worth of pills. Um, so he's obviously got a lot of money. He's obviously got a lot of people around him monitoring what he eats and what he his body needs. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to know that dieting, being really careful, feeding your body what it allegedly needs, he might he might live forever or live far longer than you and me. But most of the men in this world die at the age of 86. Um, he might reach to 150. I think the biggest problem, well, apart from heart failure, but maybe he's combated that, is the whole, as you get older, past your 70s, you have paper-thin skin, don't you? Would, I mean, he might... He might still look 18. I doubt it very much. But he'll be walking around with his skin falling off. That is the biggest barrier, isn't it? The skin. You just, like, melt away. I don't know. Um, And the thought of living forever, do I want to do that? I think so. I think so. I think I'd only want to live forever, though, if my family are also around forever. Because it's it's a bit miserable, don't you think? It'd be a bit miserable if your partner's passed away and you're just 200 years old. I suppose you find a new partner, maybe. Don't tell him that. Um, but, yeah... Guess I would want to live forever. Your thoughts on that story? Studio at strange but true radio.com. Like to hear your views. And for more on that article, go to time.com. And a report by Charlotte Alter, which is um, very interesting, very, very thought provoking, I guess. I learned today well I've learned that UFOs and UAPs have a long long history in our world we now live in I've learned that you know possibly a family of dinosaurs could be living in Loch Ness and the search for extraterrestrial life from NASA continues despite them with their report saying UFOs have not entered our atmosphere. A bit disappointing, wasn't it? I've also lived... I, I've also learned that you could possibly live forever. But would you want to? Hold that thought. Would you want to live forever? Your thoughts. Studio at strangebuttrueradio.com That's it for this edition of Strange News on Strange But True Radio Podcast with me, Philip Keeler. Join us for a new podcast on Strange News. Download every Friday. Until next week. Take care of yourselves. Be careful while you drive under bridges. Tell off lots of kids. That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs>